So, dear colleagues, we start our seminar. Uh, today, our lecture is very famous professor from Strasbourg, Professor Mir Weiss Hosseini. And I would like to present him a, with short introduction. He was born in Kabul, Afghanistan. Actually, he is exceptional class professor of chemistry at the University of Strasbourg and senior member of the Institute Université de France, chair of molecular tectonics, director of the molecular tectonics laboratory. He studied at the University of Strasbourg and obtained his master's degree in 1980 and PhD under the supervision of Professor Jean Marilén, who was a lecturer of our seminar in 1983. Professor Hosseini was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California at Berkeley and invited lecturer at the University of Western Australia in Perth. He also was associate professor at the University of Genova in Institute of Material and Chemical Research, Tsukuba, Japan. Spent time as invited professor at the University of Tokyo at the Academia Sinica, uh, Taipei, Taiwan and Politecnica di Milano, Italy and in many other universities. He has numerous different professional awards and prizes and was editor-in-chief of New Journal of Chemistry and scientific editor of Chemical Communications, both of the Journal of the Royal Society of Chemistry, special editor of Crystal Growth and Design, and member of editorial boards of several high-level journals. He was a supervisor of um, five habilitations, uh, 43 PhD theses, and more than 100 master's diploma published a lot of articles and book. Professor, please, you can start your lecture. Okay. Well, Valentin, thank you very much for the invitation. And I, as I said before, I'm delighted to deliver this lecture. And as I said also before, I'm totally prepared to help you people in Ukraine, not only in Kharkiv, but also in Kiev and many Odessa and other, other cities. Uh, as much as I can, uh, just don't hesitate to contact me. I will help you as senior scientists and I will help your students. You're, you're all most welcome to my lab if you want to come and space, spend some time, do your work, not my work, your work, and to, to take advantage of the facilities that we have the privilege to have. When I compare my situation with your situation, it's unbelievable. You are probably better scientists than me, but you don't have the, 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 the possibility to express yourself today because you are, uh, you are under war situation, which is totally not acceptable. And as you mentioned, I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan. So with the, I know what happened when Afghanistan was invaded. So I completely understand your situation in Ukraine and you're willing to get out of this as soon as possible to reconstruct all those destroyed parts. So now, if you don't mind, I will switch to my lecture. I will take you to a, a small tour into the, the world of supramolecular chemistry, but in the solid state. More specifically, I will tell you about crystalline materials. So what I started to do back in 1990 was to apply concepts developed in the context of molecular recognition and molecular association to extend this to repetitive self-assembly processes. And our aim was and still is that we don't talk about crystallization. We want to discuss crystal synthesis, not simple crystallization. That means that we believe, and we are not the only, that if you can inform your construction units that we call tecton, then you should be able to program them so that they will recognize each other and make very, very large assemblies such as crystals. Why we are so far, although we did some two dimensional studies too, interested in crystals is because as in your institute, we have this wonderful technique, which is X-ray diffraction. 
on single crystal. So we can study uh, uh, so we can uh, we, we can study very precisely the organization at the molecular level. So I will today tell you about molecular tectonics. The word molecular, you know what this is. Tectonics is coming from the Greek word, which means construction. Architecture is derived from tectonics. You know, plate tectonics, but not necessarily molecular tectonics. This word was used by Steve Mann and also Jim Wiest. At the time I started to work in this area, we were only a few groups working in this area. Today, there are many, many people involved in that. But I will not simply describe crystals. I will describe how to go from crystals to crystals of crystals. You see an example on the bottom of this slide. This is a single crystal. And then, I will tell you about a recent finding, which I think could be of interest to you, is how to weld crystals at room temperature and in solution, not under extreme conditions. And the fact that you can do that under mild conditions, you will conserve the order parameter and the continuity of order from short to long distance. I will describe this to you in a minute. Okay, so, oops. Let me tell you rapidly, especially for your students, you all know about this, my, my vision of the chemistry of today. Uh, I think that the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century was based on molecular chemistry. And that means domestication of interatomic bonds, covalent interactions, stereochemistry, confirmation. And the second half of the 20th century was very much involved in theoretical chemistry, modeling, and exploitation of intermolecular interactions. That means the concepts of designing not a molecule, but a complex molecule. But at that time, this was the beginning of the supramolecular chemistry. The complex molecule was between a substrate and a receptor. It was two, in some cases, three or four. But in general, it was two entities, molecular entities, interacting together. What I think is of importance, and I hope I'm not wrong, is 21st century, this will be system chemistry. That means all the concepts of molecular recognition, molecular association, self-assembly, self-organization will be applied to a large number of molecules so that you don't talk anymore about a complex. You can talk about the system. And when you have a system, you can introduce complexity. Complexity can be structural, can be functional. And with respect to what I'm going to present you today, one of my dream is to design a system where, I don't know when, but hopefully one day we can make chemical factories at the dimension of a crystal. If you can design a crystal with channels decorated inside, with, with different functionalities and all that, you can then induce a series of chemical transformation taking place in one part, migrating to another part, migrating to another part, being transformed and then be uh, extruded so that you can use. I do believe that one day we're gonna get there. So basically what we are doing in, in, in my group in few words, in case this is of interest to some of you, we work on molecular organization, molecular self-assembly, and molecular programming. By molecular programming, I will show you many examples. I mean that we design molecules with specific recognition sites. And we introduce an algorithm which allows them to self-assemble 
to a more complex entity. And in particular, in the solid state crystalline phase, this we will induce by construction, by synthesis, translational symmetry. You know, a crystal is by definition, uh, the, a tridimensional object with translational symmetry in all three directions of space. And then I will tell you a little bit about functional materials. materials. I don't have the time today. If you invite me another time, I will give you another completely different lecture on energy separation, uh, purification, storage, decontamination. And there is another project going on right now in my, in my group. And this has to do with molecular motors and turnstiles. So what we try to do is to design mobile dynamic systems uh, where we can control time. So we can start, initiate a catalysis, catalytic process, stop it, do something else, and then restart it. So I think there are many, many possibilities behind that. And we also worked a little bit on molecular photonics, but I don't have the time to tell you about this. So this is, I'm sure that this slide talks to the people in your institute. Uh, when you talk to chemists about crystals, they say, oh, this is, it's too small. You need a microscope to see, etc." But this is absolutely not the case. This is the giant cave crystal in Mexico. And look, if you take this crystal from here to here, it's 17 meters. If you take this diameter, this is roughly one meter. These are giant crystals. What is made by nature is gypsum. What is of interest is that you can take this crystal, as you all know, and you cut a piece anywhere. Then you do X-ray diffraction. And what do you find is the same crystal. It's the same organization. Everything is identical. So that means that you can, if you handle not crystallization only, but crystal synthesis, you can go from molecules to large size molecular assemblies ordered as a crystal. So this is what I'm going to tell you, but I'm not gonna present you a 17 meter crystal, obviously, because you need some very, very specific conditions to get there. And actually you see the people in there, the humidity is so high that they have to wear, wear mask and uh, gas oxygen, air supply. Otherwise they cannot stand there for even not half an hour. So let's go. This is the, my background and, and the strategy that we follow for many times now, very long time. We start with molecules. I was trained in organic chemistry, organic synthesis. So we start with molecules. We know how to interconnect molecules, uh, atoms into molecules. These molecules are designed so they contain within their structure specific, you see this and that. These are specific recognition sites. These recognition sites, when they are in contact, they generate what we call a recognition pattern. And if you repeat the recognition pattern in one, two, or three dimension of space, here is only in one direction, you will generate a network. So these, <coughs> pardon, these recognition pattern, they become assembling nod of the structure. And then from there, you generate a crystal. But the crystal is not a single network. A crystal, for example, in the case of 1D network, is the compaction of 1D networks in all three dimensions of space. So this is self-assembly, and then this going from this network to the crystal is self-organization. And well, so far, you will tell me our first year students, they know that, understand that. But what is of interest is that we can go from crystals to crystals of crystals. 
This is called core shell crystals. I will describe you this in detail. Then what is even of more interest to me at least, and I think this was perhaps somehow interesting, is how to weld crystals. You see this, this object that you see here, it's a one, two, three, four, five component, single crystal. You have the continuity of short and long range order. And what is perhaps even more interesting is that you can make mosaics of crystals as a single crystal. So another term, if you go to that side of my slide, this is the increasing of molecular organization from atoms to mosaics of crystals. So what is of important, uh, importance here is that the crystal synthesis is based on supramolecular synthesis. It's based on reversible recognition process, but these reversible recognition process are repeated. This is how you generate the translational symmetry. So, Vitalo, Vitali, yourself, you all know about that. This is roughly what you see here, plus minus something is the toolbox of supramolecular chemistry. Another term, the toolbox of non-covalent molecular interactions, intermolecular interactions. It ranges from, you know, coordination bond, if I go that way, metal-metal interactions, I will give you examples, pi-pi, pi-cation, pi-CH bond formation, halogen bond, hydrogen bond, electrostatic interactions, van der Waals contacts, etc. So I know that there are some of your colleagues who are uh, pure physicists and they might consider this as a joke, but we chemists and myself as a, although I was trained in, in, in math and physics, uh, the fact to chop the energy scale into different domains, for a physicist, this doesn't make any sense. But for us chemists, it's very operational because you categorize your type of interactions and then you can design objects where you will use one, two, or several of those interactions. This is all, it's an aid for the design, if you wanna put it that way. So let's go. What I think is of interest in this approach, maybe, is the fact that there is no limitation as long as your imagination works and you're capable of synthesizing, preparing compounds, you can generate a tremendous amount of variety of architectures. Here, for example, on the top, it's a system with two complementary tectons, T1, T2. This is the recognition pattern. This system is programmed to generate a 1D network. But you can also design and generate a 2D network. It's a sheet. We can also do the same thing, if I have the time, I will show you, the, the, to generate 3D networks. And if you look at it, and now this is more for people who are deeply in, into crystallography, what is of interest is that when you generate a crystal based on 1D networks, the crystal is Trans, has translation in three direction of space. If you have a 1D network, your system is deterministic in one dimension, not deterministic in the other two. If you go to, to 2D networks, you, the system is deterministic. That means it's programmed to generate sheets, but the third dimension is not deterministic. The system will self-organize to find the way to pack to generate a periodic 3D object. Now, what is of interest? Let's consider here. This is a 2D network. Obviously, you can design. This 2D network is based on two complementary tectons. But why not using uh, this type of tecton? 
this is again a two component tecton, a two component system. This is a network, but this network is different from that one. But because you see the, these assembling knots recognition pattern are not the same. So you increase, or in that case it's increased, in that case, you decrease the symmetry. Now you're all aware of something which is called the theory of information. And one part of this theory of information is based on the content of information and symmetry. If you increase the symmetry, the most symmetrical object, it's a sphere. A sphere in terms of a, a formation is very poor. Because if you know one, one point on the surface of the sphere, you know all the rest. As you decrease the symmetry, you increase the content of information. So this is perhaps for those who are interested in uh, molecular programming, it could be something of interest to think about. But now I uh, keep on going. What about using three different here, one, two, three, three different tectons. Now here, you see, this is again, another type of network. You can program that. We went up to a five component system. I'm sure that somebody in Ukraine or maybe in, in your institute will come up with a system where the person will be capable of predicting and designing so that you have seven, eight, nine components with four or five different recognition pattern. When they see each other, they will self-assemble and then self-organize to a periodic architecture, a crystal, with hopefully a task-specific material. This is really the, the, the challenge of tomorrow. So I'm, I'm sorry for those who are really into uh, crystals and crystallography, but for some, it may be of interest. We know what a crystal is. So if you have a system with two different tectons, only blue and red, and the gray that you see here is the interaction pattern. It's the recognition pattern. So here, what I present schematically, it's a 1D network. And this 1D network is now packed to generate a sheet. And now these sheets are packed like that to generate the crystal. This is the definition of a crystal, nothing specific about it. What you can see is a two component periodic, this system crystal in position, and this is important, and in composition. You have alternation of blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, etc. There is something that solid state chemists, they know very well. Molecular chemists, not necessarily that well. And this is called crystalline solid solutions. Crystalline solid solutions, the one I represent here, is a three component system, same type of recognition pattern. And you see, you have blue, red, blue, red, and from time to time, you have green. So this system is periodic in position. It's exactly the same position here than here, but it's randomly distributed in composition. I will show you many examples later on. This is something which is known in particular in, with nanoparticles, but we prepared and others subsequently prepared. This is called a Cauchy crystal, a crystal of a crystal. But what is important here is that this part is composed of red and green. This part is composed of red and blue. And the overall system is made by 3D epitaxial growth. So this system is a single crystal with different zones, but these zones are differentiated because their composition is different. And finally, what you see here on the right, this is something that we published very recently. And to the best of my knowledge, this was not documented before. And this is how to weld crystals. So you have a crystal here and you have another crystal here. 
And these two crystals are welded with this crystal. And the overall system is a single crystal. So this is hierarchical construction of a single crystal with different zones, crystalline zones, with maintenance of the short and long range order. I will show you examples. Let me move a little bit faster. Today, I will mainly tell you about a combination of hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions. So the design principle was to alternate between plus and minuses and then in between using hydrogen bonding. And in that particular case, we wanted to use a dihapto mode of hydrogen bonding. I'm not going to elaborate on that. You know, this is well known. Now, the difficulty, as you know, as usual, is how to translate these cartoons into molecules. This is where it gets complicated. So with a bit of reading, knowledge, and intuition, I thought that we could use the cyclic amidine. The cyclic amidine can be easily protonated. The pKa is around 12.5 or something. And you see when it's, once it's protonated, it's a cation and you have two divergently oriented hydrogen bond donor sites. Now you can play with this red part. You can put, I will show you anything you want so that you can control the angle between these two hydrogen bond donating sites. And furthermore, being an organic chemist, synthetic chemist, you know, with, with these amidines, you can easily functionalize that position. So you can connect two of those together. And by using a proper spacer, you can very precisely, I will show you, control the distance between the two here, polarized hydrogens on each face of the molecule. So this molecule, you can look at it as a double face scotch tape, which will interconnect this the dianions. Let me give you a few. This is a, a part of what we have prepared in my group over the many, many years now. And I'm not going to comment on that because I'm going to talk about one or two. But you see, you can introduce chirality, you can make liquid crystals, you can introduce luminescence. You can, there, there are many, many things that you can do with this kind of system. So let's start now to play a little bit. I will tell you about how to recognize metal cyanide. For example, dicyanomethylate, tetracyanomethylate, hexacyanomethylate. All these drawings that you see here have been made before we got the crystal structure. It's not like, you know, we have a crystal structure and we try to make up a story out of it. So let's start with the first one. Interesting. You take these two bisamidinium that you can see here, and what is the difference between the two? This is a five-membered ring. This is a six-membered ring. We did exactly the same thing with six-membered, sorry, with six-membered ring here and five-membered ring here. Doesn't change anything. Now the major difference is the connector between the two. CH2, CH2 versus a phenyl group. This controls the distance between these hydrogens. If you take this compound and you put it in the presence of dicyanoarate or argentate, you get immediately thousands of crystals and you determine the crystal structure. You see these are 1D network. Good. The distance between gold and gold is 3.3 angstrom. 3.3 angstrom, that means that there should be some metallophilic interactions. Yes, indeed, the metallophilic interactions within the network generates luminescent crystals. This is the excitation. This is the emission. Now, you can shift from gold to silver. The same story you see here. These two are isostructural and almost isometric. Now, if you shift from this tecton, dicationic tecton to this one, you generate this kind of network, 
you see now again it's a 1d network the distance between two gold atoms or two silver atoms is above four angstrom there is no specific orophilic or metallophilic interactions these two will not be luminescent so you can control this property and what is of interest here is the fact that you by design and construction you generate what we call an emerging property the individual individual sorry units are not luminescent it's only the organization which renders the the crystal luminescent let's keep on going now i'm not going to tell you about tetracyanomethylate because i don't have the time but let's go to hexacyanomethylate we use this compound and this compound was published uh, before we published the crystal structure and it was said in that paper that this was made to recognize hexacyanomethylate iron 3 cobalt 3 chromium 3 so and the way they should interact it was a dihapto mode of hydrogen bonding okay maybe of interest to some of you, 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 you know, you obviously know what chirality is. Chirality is not a metric property, it's a topological property. So that means that it can, an object can be chiral at the molecular level or at the macroscopic level. If you look at the room where, where you're sitting and listening to me, you will find no center of symmetry, no plane of symmetry, your surrounding is chiral. So what here we show, and this was not again documented, is that by using hydrogen bonding chelates, we can generate supramolecular chirality at the second coordination sphere, delta and lambda. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about this here. So now what we do is we prepare this compound that I showed you before, and we prepared this compound with the OH group. Here, this will extend. This is one, two, three, four hydrogen bond donor site. This is one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogen bond donor site. Let me just go one back and to tell you that in the case of iron, cobalt, and chromium, these structures, these are sheets. They are, in all three cases, they are isostructural and almost isometric. These sheets are packed so that you generate channels. These are the channels. And these channels are filled with water molecules. These water molecules are not individual water molecules. It's a water polymer. This can be of interest for, for example, proton conducting materials, but I'm not gonna talk about the, 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 this property. I will tell you something else. So there we go. And now we use chrome chromium, iron, cobalt, oxidation state three. And we prepared all these pure crystals. Come on, the, come on, sorry. This one is with chromium, this one is with iron, and this one is with cobalt, with this ticked off. Now we can do exactly the same thing with this one, you see? And what is of interest, perhaps, is that you can even generate solid solutions. And in that particular case, this will be a solid solution with one, two, three different cyanomethylate entities. So it's a ternary solid solution. This is a binary. How we can see that? Well, interestingly, the iron is slightly yellowish, where I'm talking about iron three, cobalt and chromium are colorless. Now, when you generate these, this ternary solid solution, you can vary the concentration, the ratio of iron to cobalt to chromium. And thus, as you can see here, you can precisely tune the color of the solid solution. But let me remind you that this solid solution is a single crystal. So we studied it, this by many, many different techniques, in particular here, I'm telling you 
about looking at this by infrared and we can show how this functions. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Now, this is another interesting story, maybe. If you take this entity, there is no hydroxy present here. The water molecules inside the channel, they don't specifically interact with the channels. Now, by design, if you introduce hydroxy group here and here, you will get to that situation. And in that situation, the water molecules inside the cavity, they should interact with this hydroxy group because they are hydrogen bond donor. So what happens, we show that, we can now make a solid solution composed of, let's use one of the, the, the metal cyanide, iron, for example, we did it for all three. And now what you see, you vary, Jesus Christ, you vary this and this, and look, what you can do is you can modulate the temperature of water release depending on the ratio of this to that. So this is for the solid solution. Now let's play another little game. In that particular case, I shift from metal exocyanide with the metal in the oxidation state three, I shift to the metal in the oxidation state two. You will see in a minute why. That means that M will be ruthenium or iron. In the case of iron two, this is orange crystals. In the case of ruthenium two, these are colorless crystals. But these structures, as you can see, are isometric and almost iso, sorry, they're isostructural and almost isometric. That means that the cell parameters are very close. And this is the way they pack into uh, 2D networks. Now, let's see what we can do with that. We're gonna pick up a crystal of ruthenium exocyanide, colorless. We take this crystal, we attach it, we we'll glue it to a, copper or Teflon wire, we put it in a beaker and we add this tecton and exocyano metallate solution. We let the system grow. After a certain time, you pick up your crystal. It's an orange crystal. You might say, okay, it's orange crystal. Who cares? This should be iron exocyanide. Well, in fact, you know the, the history of this crystal because this is why we pick up a given crystal. What you do is you do X-ray diffraction on that crystal. It's a single crystal, you see here. You see slightly differences here. This is because ruthenium and iron are not exactly the same cell parameters. They differ very slightly. And what is interesting is that if you cut your crystal, look what you get. This is the ruthenium crystal. This is the iron crystal around it. And the interface that we studied with the, by microscopy and other techniques is a solid solution. So we call this generation one with respect to this is generation zero. This is generation one. If what I'm telling you is correct, then we should be able to do, to go to generation one bar, ruthenium iron, iron, ruthenium, generation two, two bar, three, four, et cetera. So we prepared all these compounds and they may be of interest as waveguide, et cetera, but I'm not gonna drill on this. Let's prepare now solid solutions. Ruthenium, iron, orange, almost colorless. And now by varying the ratio of iron to ruthenium, we can control the color of these crystals. And now from these crystals, we can make these core shell crystals. Here is 25, 75, here is 50, 50, et cetera. So we prepared all that and we are capable of doing this. Now, if you allow me, I will switch to the last part of my talk, and I will go more rapidly because I don't want to bother you. Let's design another system. 
Again, we start with this dicationic tecton. And this one is a pyridine tricarboxylic acid derivative. Very easy to prepare. We prepare 50 grams in a row. And interestingly, this compound, ligand now, forms complexes with a whole variety of metals. And interestingly, as you can see here, by choosing the nature of the metal, you can here tune the color of the crystal, like as you can see it here. So basically this is what we do. We prepare all these complexes, monoclinic C2 over C, Z equals four, general formula is the same, crystallizes with water molecule, and then we can use manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. These are all isostructural. And you can see here, they're all almost isometric. You see, for example, 1773, 1775, and here the same, etc. So that means that since they are isostructural, almost isometric, we can play with them. Interestingly, all these crystals, this is powder X-ray diffraction, they're perfectly robust and stable. Now look what we can do. We start with a crystal, and now we're gonna make a core shell crystal. And this is diffraction frame, as you can see here. Here we start a combination of iron orange with copper, bluish iron with zinc, zinc with nickel, copper with cobalt. You see, this is the core crystal, this is the shell. Now you should recognize that these are rod type crystals. Let me go, sorry. These are all rod type crystals. That means that you have one fastest growth axis. So we take advantage of that, and you can see that we can make core shell, and you see that these core shell crystals, they slightly increase here, but mainly they grow along the fastest growth axis. So you might say, okay, fine, you showed it before, now you have another system and it works, so what? Now look what we can do. This is how to weld crystals. So what we do is we take a crystal, AA, we cut it into two, we align it along the long, longest growth axis, we put a drop, a solution. For welding, this solution contains the tectones, and in that particular case, contains the component composing the crystal A, okay? So we call this homo welding. It's like repairing a broken crystal. It works, I will show you examples. What is more interesting is to weld these two crystals with a third crystalline zone. So AA solution, which contains B, you form ABA crystals. And even more challenging, is to do a AC, two different crystals, welded with a third crystal. So you have a sequence, C, Jesus, C, B, A. So basically what I'm telling you, this is why I say that we are doing here crystal synthesis. It's like polymer synthesis. We make sequences that we can control. So, We start here with iron. This is the initial crystal. We cut it into two. We place it face to face along the, the axis, and now we weld it. This is the welded crystal. And look at the parameters of the welded zone and the parameters of the initial zone. You see it corresponds. Now let's homo welding. Even better. We start with iron, we cut it into two, and now we weld it here with nickel. 
let me just remind you that we are talking about macroscopic objects. These are crystals, real crystals. That means that we can focus the beam, the X-ray beam on the zone that we want. So we can focus it on that zone or we can focus it on that zone. And we can determine the cell parameters. And now just follow me and watch this. It, it sounds magic, but it's not magic, it's true, it's reality, repeated many, many times. Yes, so you can see here that you weld the crystal here, but you also, the crystal grows here and here because you're not in a confined space and the crystal also grows along this direction. This is because you're not in, in a confined space. So I'll show you how to overcome this. But just a comment on sorry, apologize. You see here, look at this central zone here. You will see in a minute a defect appearing here. Even this, we know where it comes from is because of presence of, of, of air bubbles. If you degas your solutions, you can avoid the presence of this kind of defect. Okay, so let's go. Cobalt, and we're gonna weld it with zinc. Again, we look at by like, X-ray diffraction on the welded zone and non-welded zone. And now this is the interesting one. I don't know why it goes like crazy. Now we use a crystal made out of iron and this and this tecton and cobalt with the, the same tecton here. And these are the two crystals aligned. And now we're gonna weld it with nickel. Look at this. You see, again, it's the same story. We can do now A, B, C crystals. But the problem that we have here is that we don't control this part, this part, this part, and this part because we're not in confined space. So how can we do that? This is a very tricky problem if you think about it, and it's not easy to solve. So the way we tackle this problem is, Bonjour. Yeah, J just before telling you about how we over managed to overcome this problem, just to show you a series of photograph of crystals, not what we can generate. We can really generate mosaics of crystals. Because of the strategy that we use, these are all palindromes, manganese, manganese. That means that you have a, a plane of symmetry here in terms of nomenclature and composition, copper, 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 cobalt, etc. So we can prepare all these compounds. Now, look, we can also make core shell, welded core shell crystals, huge variety of species that you can generate. And it's interesting because it's a way to sequence crystals. And now let's try to overcome this problem of the fact that you're not in confined space and the growth process will continue along the, the growth axis. So let's see how we can do that. We take a crystal. We embed this crystal in a gel, TMS, and 20% and water forms a gel. So now your crystal is embedded in the gel. This gel is soft enough so that you can cut it. 
we cut the gel and we expose only one face of the crystal. Now we do the growth process. So it's a AB sequence. And since this is a hydrogel, if you leave it for 12 hours, hours, sorry, on the shelf, the gel decomposes. It gets dehydrated. So what you can get is this crystal. You see now there is only growth here, not there. Now you can take the same crystal, re-embed it in a gel, cut now at that level here, and grow another crystal. This is the ABC sequence. Now, you start with this crystal, you put it in the gel, and now you cut the gel in the crystal. And now the two, you weld it with another zone, remove the gel, and you got now A, B, A system. So we can, you know, we can really control this. This is one of the reasons why I'm telling you, talking about crystal synthesis. And now look, iron, gel, cut it, growth, iron, zinc. Now you take the iron, zinc, and you do iron, zinc, nickel. And we could continue like that. So that means that we can, now we are able to make crystals, single crystals with different crystalline components. And each crystalline components will can exhibit a different specific task. There's one of my postdocs currently working on the compounds with spin crossover and active and non-active zones and all that. So this is, you know, crystal, gel, cap the two, weld the two, you see, crystal, the gel, weld, and you got this sequence, iron, nickel, iron. So I hope that the, during this talk, uh, I was able to show you that there are many, many things to do, in particular with the application of supramolecular chemistry and the material science and also in the crystalline uh, domain. And in particular, I hope that you're convinced that we can beyond crystallization, we can today talk about crystal synthesis, like you make a covalent synthesis of a molecule rather complicated if needed, you can make the synthesis of crystals. And I believe that this can open uh, some possibilities in material science and devices, specifically task specific devices for tomorrow. This work was done by Olivier Felix, who started, and then Pierre de Chambonnois. He's a CNRS researcher now. Uh, Pierre is a, a associate professor now in Bordeaux. Uh, Serena Adloff, he has a position now in a company in Germany. Nathalie Kirin-Sakas, she did all the crystallography I owe her very much. Carmen Parashiv and Gabriela Marinescu from Budapest, uh, they, uh, sorry, Bucharest, they, they, they spent a year as postdoc in my group and they were involved in this work. And Sylvie Ferlet, who was left the group and she's doing uh, other things, was also associated with this work money from all these sources, and merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and I'm with you and ready to respond to any questions you wish. Uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation of uh, magic results and something like miracle. Okay, dear colleagues, do you have questions? Please, yeah, you can put, please. Professor Kamarov. I think your, your microphone is on mute. You have to, your microphone is on mute. Ah, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, I, yes, I, yes. Was, I, I was still basically thanking, uh, and I, I would like to thank you for such an inspiring 
and uh, indeed magic magic talk uh, and uh, in ideas. Uh, my question is probably a layman question. Uh, are there similar structures in nature? Uh, Turmalines from Afghanistan, for example, came to my mind. And most important, if there is something in nature we can learn from. You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. They are, as you know, a whole series of, uh, of solid materials, crystals called alams. Alams are made, for example, out of sulfate with different metals. And the nature generates this and then for, to my opinion, non-scientists, they make money out of that because they, they call it the magic stone because it's composed of two different crystalline parts and all that. And as you know, alum or what I showed you today, I should have said that actually, what I showed you today, these are not twins. These are not twins. This is not a crystal growing on another crystal. It's a epitaxial 3D growth. So at the end, the orientation, axis and everything are exactly the same. So these are not twins. These are single crystals with different components. You're right, they are, they are alums in nature since ever. And uh, actually when you think no reason not to find this in nature. Because as long as the cell parameters in the, 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 they are isostructural, there is no reason not to grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Any other questions? Valentin, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, first of all, uh, my compliments uh, to your lecture, uh, and uh, I have uh, the next question. I know that, and we know that you worked with tech uh, elixirins a lot and published <laughs> many nice articles and published a uh, uh, review in book Calixarin uh, 2001. And uh, uh, did you try to use diacalixarines as tectones for, for crystals formation? Oh, yeah, Vitaly, this is a very good, uh, this is a very good question. We use not only diacalixarines, but also diamercaptocalixarines. Mm -hmm. You know all this the, better than I do. We use this for making coordination networks. So we have crystals by formation of coordination bond between metals and sulfur, either as a thiol ether or as a thiol SH. And we published uh, a series of, uh, of crystals. Uh, I can show you, I can send you some papers. And also we used these calixarines, thiocalixarines to make some huge 32 atom clusters of cobalt and iron. Mm -hmm. So these calixarines, they serve, these are not networks, these are finite discrete structures, but these uh, calixarines and one, three alternate, sorry, in cone conformation, they generate, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, and they form a 32, 32 core uh, particle. Mm -hmm. But what could be of interest, Vitaly, since I know uh, a little bit what you're doing, you're doing absolutely fantastic chemistry, and also you have, it's your mark, you have introduced that, all these phosphorus containing calixarines. And I think that there is a lot of possibilities if you're interested in that we could explore to make crystal engineering using phosphorus-based calixarines. But now instead of going to nickel cobalt and all that, uh, we could go to lanthanide and actinide because we can use the PO bond, the oxygen as a coordinating site. I have, I have some ideas if you wish to, I, I would 
be delighted to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, dear colleagues, please welcome to discussion. Questions? Uh, I maybe have not a question, but only comment uh, with that volunteer. Yeah, you're all right. Okay. Uh, uh, we are uh, want to tell that you will be have very uh, after our victory we will have very nice opportunity to, to visit Ukraine in 2025 and I think that we all together will invite to this uh, lecture for the European Council Rapid Meeting, uh, which will be in review. And I very hope that we can meet you in the crystallographic meeting this year in Versailles. So it will be nice to meet you and to discuss perspectives for next uh, talks. With pleasure. As I said at the <coughs> beginning of my talk, you can all, all of you, I understand yeah. very well what you are facing today, deeply. And uh, as I promised you, you can count on me. Uh, if you ask Alexander Varnek that I know for ages, uh, I never promise something that I don't do. So when I say that you can count on me, you can count on me. Tell me what I can do. If I can do it, I will do it. Thank you. See you in my, soon in August. Oh, yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. OK, very nice comment. So, dear colleagues, would you like to, to ask something about this interesting, not only chemistry, Professor Chernovsky? I only <coughs> would like to say that there is a question of uh, Victor Tokarev in chat because he has no con con good contact. Okay. Can you answer? It's a rather interesting question related to metamaterials. So, I only join to this question. So, thank you for great lecture. Crystal welding would be a very versatile method for fabricate, to fabricate metamaterials, non-structured materials also. Are there any initiative to scale up this process, make it industrial? I am without sounds today. It's uh, comments of Victor Topper. Do you have yeah. any additional, can you give any additional information about application in uh, modern nanotechnology, spintronics, uh, oh, very nanoelectronics. Good. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very good point. About applications, we published a paper two years ago where we can use these uh, core shell crystals and welded crystals as mm -hmm. waveguide. Mm -hmm. so, so do you have references to this uh, review or this? I'm sorry? References, can you present some references? Uh, I, uh, 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 About application, yeah, it's very important. Yes. It's very interesting, it's very important. If, if, if you don't mind, you, you, you can ask Vitaly or you can ask Valentine to give you my email. Okay. It's easy okay. to, to find. You just send me an email and I will immediately send you the, the preprint, mm -hmm. the PDF format of the paper. Mm -hmm. So this is one possibility. And one of the things, that I'm, I'm working on now, which I think it could be of interest, is to use these yeah. mosaics of oh. crystals as optical multiplexer. So you have a single crystal with different zones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you shine light, specific light, mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. parts of the crystal mm -hmm. responds. So if you control now the distance between the parts, the zones, who are responding, transmitting the light, you have a special resolution on the emission too. So there are, there are you know, for example, I uh, don't want to go into detail of that because I don't know if it's going to work or not, but you can, you know, generate some, perhaps some strange types of interferences at low distance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I posted uh, electronic address of Professor Hosseini in uh, chat. Okay, okay. fantastic. Uh, I so found please, it. Yes. please contact me. 
okay. if you have any question, if you need papers, publications, not from my group necessarily, I'm not necessarily interested in what we are doing, but anything that I can do to help you, I will do it. Okay, so if you want to come to my group, you will have your office, you will have all the resources, you can do your research, not my research, I'm not, I'm not hiring slaves, it's not at all my, my mentality, you can come and, and do whatever you want. This will be my contribution to, to your science. Thank you. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, we have a time for more questions, if you have it. Valentine, if, uh, if yeah. you are interested in, and your colleagues, uh, if you want, I can give you, whenever you want, another completely different talk on molecular dynamic systems, like turnstiles, machines, and all that. This could be of maybe of interest to your students and colleagues. Yes, you are right, and maybe in the future, at the end of this year, we will return to you. Yeah, uh, with pleasure. And uh, ask about another, because uh, now we have some uh, speakers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Until the November of this year, so after the November, we can we can give you a possibility to to speak again here. And to I know that Jean for us. Very, good, very good talk. Jean Pierre Sauvage is giving a talk in uh, around September or something. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very yeah. good. Very yes, good. Uh, so Sauvage is the beginning of September. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. It, it, it will be two two seminars with his lecture. One yeah. about uh, molecular machines. Yeah. Of course, and uh, another about, uh, I think, uh, special compounds on ketonan, and so on. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Topology in chemistry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So if you don't have more questions, okay. Thank you again for a very nice presentation. Um, I listened to this uh, interest. And I hope we'll meet maybe in Ukraine yes. on conferences or maybe in Strasbourg on conference. Absolutely. So you are welcome. In Merci Ukraine. beaucoup. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really honored. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you. So, Jacqueline. So, bye. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>